Mais uma vez, obrigado por terem abordado a apresentação do Porto Arts da Bernante. Foi um livro que me, curiosamente, foi recomendado pelo, pelo João Barreiros. Não sei se na cá está. Não sei se só o leu todo, mas na altura recomendaste-me vivamente e. E eu li o livro muito rapidamente e falei e, e adorei. E acho que foi o primeiro livro de steampunk que, que li. Portanto, uh, sou um bocadinho também a desconfiar, que eu esteja a vender o livro, porque ao final de cada um livro da editora, vocês vão pensar, está a puxar para um livro que vai fazer dinheiro. Mas, assim, estes livros, quando nós os publicamos, uh, dificilmente são para fazer dinheiro, porque são livros grandes, como vocês podem ver. Nunca estes, estes clássicos. Fantástico, nunca, nunca tem menos de 500 e tal páginas. São livros muito dispendiosos de produzir a nível de tradução, de revisão, de impressão. Eu acho que a última coisa que nós pensamos quando escolhemos um livro destes para publicar é ah, se vai dar dinheiro ou não. Uh, não, é, não é anormal perder-se dinheiro com estes livros. Agora, dá um gozo bestial publicá-los e felizmente nós temos conseguido equilibrar as contas na editora entre livros que vendem bem e livros que vendem mal, e assim equilibrar um bocado também o nosso, o nosso lado mais emocional, entre os livros que não nos dizem muito e os livros que nos dizem muito. Uh, fiquei a saber mais tarde que este livro, de certa forma, revolucionou o steampunk, que era um termo que, estava, uh, que não era muito apreciado pelos editores. O steampunk até é uma história que se passa de uma vitoriana fantástica, em que a tecnologia, como o próprio nome diz, é a tecnologia de vapor, mas que é levada sempre a expoentes completamente fantásticos, máquinas impossíveis, zeppelins, robôs, inteligência artificial. Era um termo de steampunk que estava associado a mais vendas, a livros de segunda qualidade, e acho que nenhum editor apreciava associar-se a esse termo. E este livro veio mudar isso. Apesar de ser um autor do Reino Unido, acabou também por influenciar a, a noção de steampunk nos Estados Unidos, e a partir daí já passou a ser um, um género um, prestigiante e que muitas editoras investiram e que muitos autores desenvolveram. Portanto, estou aqui a falar em português, o Stefan está a olhar para mim, não está a perceber absolutamente nada. Uh, portanto, eu vou passar para ele. Vos posso dizer, lá está, é um livro que publicamos porque é um livro fabuloso, é uma tiragem pequena. O que vocês têm aqui esta edição vermelha, é uma tiragem ainda mais limitada que nós fizemos, está, está assinada pelo autor. São só 200 exemplares. Uh, e o livro só vai para o mercado daqui a 4 ou 5 meses, não tenho bem a certeza. Março. Só em março é que vai para o mercado. Portanto, recomendo-vos a leitura. É uma leitura trepidante, é uma aventura fabulosa. Foi um livro que revolucionou um género. Hoje em dia há livros deste género por todo lado, mas foi este que desencadeou esta nova vaga. E vou, vou agora então começar a falar com o Stefan, senão ele fica desconfortável. Stefan, I was. I was saying good things, nice things about your book. Yeah, no, I, did, I didn't understand a word. I feel a bit like a, one of those sort of weddings in, in a, you know, far off Seychelles or somewhere where they could be saying anything. I can see him smile. I was, I was saying nice, nice things about your, your, your novel. Um, but now I want you to say some nice things about your novel too. I thought you to say nice things about my publisher. I'm very happy to do So, tell us, you wrote this uh, like six, seven, seven years, six years ago? Yeah, I mean, I guess I started writing this in, in 2005 and probably took a year to, to write it. And uh, then, of course, I, I had to sort of give it to my agent and he sold it fairly quickly to HarperCollins. Uh, it actually, there was, a, there was a big auction in the UK for the rights for the book. So um, there, were, there were about sort of two or three of the, the bigger publishers in the UK were bidding for the book, which as a, as a sort of a, a first time novelist was a fairly surreal experience because we were just happy to get it published, to be honest, and to actually have lots of big publishing companies fighting each other for the chance to publish it was, was very bizarre. And the offer rising? Yeah, that, that was, I guess that's why they take it to auction, really. Um, so yeah, the, the money went up and yeah, I, I was very happy. I mean, like I say, as, as, a, as a first time novelist, as, as probably many of you here or aspiring to be writers or, or are writers, you know that it, it's, it's tricky and it's difficult. And, I mean, I spent 10 years in the kind of uh, 
you know, wanting to be a writer but not never quite making it to stages. Uh, you just have to persevere, really. And in the end, I got there. And uh, yeah, so it was it was just strange. Like I said, I would have been overjoyed just to get that novel out there, but uh, it came out. And uh, it, I think I can thank my my agent, John Gerald, for that. He used to be an editor for a number of the big publishing houses, so he had lots of contacts, which I guess as a, a starting writer you, you don't really have yourself. So I understand the agents aren't, aren't so big in Portugal. No, we, we, we only have one thing. agent in Portugal. Okay. Everybody's been good friends with him, I bet. So I, I was saying before that this book, and you, you told me that, that this book changed the perception uh, of this genre in the in the market. Steampunk was something that editors didn't want to be associated oh, with. Yeah, very much. It was it was a bit of a dirty word. In fact, when I first, you know, when the book was coming out, all the people in the publishing company said to me, "Don't mention steampunk. Don't mention steampunk." It was sort of like a sort of dirty word uh, that you just you you weren't. You, know, you weren't meant to mention. And to be honest, in my own mind, I'd never really associated my book solidly with the sort of steampunk genre in as much as I, I kind of considered that I'd written a fantasy novel that had as a, a backdrop a Victorian setting as opposed to the sort of standard medieval setting that you find in Tolkien or, or David Eddings or any of the kind of the epic fantasy books. Um, but the, the success of the book, um, like I say, going to auction, being fought over, it was the first debut fantasy novel to actually get placed in a very large supermarket chain called Tesco's, which increasingly controls the sort of the British book market, which again is, is just an unheard of event. Um, and it, it, it did very well, and it was, uh, it was selected by the Bernal, the, the, the largest European film festival, for some sort of presentation to all the directors. And at one point it looked like it was going to be hot light into a movie. So there was a lot of sort of buzz over that first book. And I think after that, the kind of the steampunk phenomena, uh, as a literary form anyway, sort of was slowly taking off. Um, and I guess as a, as a cultural phenomena now, perhaps more in the States than in the UK, you have a, a very large swathe of people who kind of have steampunk as a lifestyle in the same way as you would have had perhaps punk in the, in the 80s, where they, they dress up in the Victorian clothes. And I mean, that, that's a whole topic in itself, really. I, I don't think it has that much to do with the literature. And anecdotal evidence I've heard is that people who are really into the sort of steampunk culture don't particularly read that much of, of the steampunk novels, although they do seem to be very successful out in, in the States at the moment in terms of numbers. Although I think you can argue some of them are sort of, you know, they're kind of having fun with the genre, really, they're kind of putting sort of bees into the kind of American Civil War setting and that kind of thing and doing quite well out of it. But, uh, yeah, I, I've never really classified my book as you know, the pure steampunk of, say, the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. I mean, I think you have to have a proper kind of Victorian historical setting to be, to be considered uh, steampunk and have it rooted slightly in reality, even if it is the reality of Captain Nemo and uh, those kind of characters. Okay. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about the story? Yeah, sure. I mean, in some ways it's a standard kind of fantasy uh, plot in that you have the, uh, the two sort of young protagonists, a girl called Molly and a boy called Oliver, and then they both sort of start off basically at the bottom of the heap in, in society. Molly is uh, stuck in what's called a workhouse. I don't know if you ever had that kind of phenomena over here, but in Victorian times, basically if you were poor and you didn't have any money, they would stick you in these kind of factories for the poor where you were basically kept as a prisoner and forced to do work for the state. Uh, because you couldn't feed yourself and lots of abandoned children obviously found themselves in that position. So Molly starts off in, in, in one of these kind of uh, state institutionalised kind of orphanage stroke prisons that are used <coughs> as work camps really. And uh, the, the boy protagonist Oliver, he starts off in the north of the country which is a kind of a, a pseudo kind of satirical English take, if you like, on the 18th century as viewed through a, a fantasy prison. And he's basically under suspicion of being a mutant and uh, is, is being held and, uh, you know, basically under house arrest, if you like, and hasn't got any friends because everybody's a bit suspicious of him. And they both get involved in uh, basically people trying to kill them and they have to go on the run and try and work out why these people are trying to kill them. And 